to be welcoming you tonight. Sorry, it's International Talk Like a Pirate Day today. Welcome, my name is Greg Gorg, Executive Director of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you all. Great crowd tonight. Great to have you all here. I want to thank you for being here tonight. Our speaker tonight is no stranger to the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. Uh, Bob Schwemmer is currently the West Coast Regional Maritime Heritage Coordinator for NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. He coordinates and conducts archaeological surveys and research for the five National Marine Sanctuaries located along the Pacific West Coast. His deep water projects include the Montebello, a World War II era oil tanker that was sunk by the Japanese. The Pack Baroness, a bulk carrier located at a depth of 1,500 feet off Point Conception as well as the first archaeological survey of the USS Macon, a 780-foot, 5-foot U.S. Navy dirigible lost off Point Sur and now resting in 1,500 feet of water. He also assisted during the recovery of the gun turret for the, from the Civil War Navy ship USS Monitor, which was uh, found off the uh, coast of Cape Hatteras. And uh, his most recent discovery was the George E. Billings, a five-masted lumber schooner sunk off Santa Barbara Island. Bob currently serves on the board of directors of, of course, the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. Surprised that wasn't at the top of his bio. <laughs> <laughs> um, Best for last. We'll have to fix very that next good. time. Very good. And is currently president of the Los Angeles Maritime Museum Research Society. And in 2012, Bob received the award of operational merit from the United States Coast Guard Department of Homeland Security for his exceptional service during the historic and unprecedented underwater assessment of the shipwreck Montebello. For fun, Bob is an award-winning photographer and his personal as well as his, uh, and his, his, uh, his personal as well as his photography on behalf of NOAA has been published in books, magazines, documentaries, the internet, newspapers worldwide, and now in an exhibit at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. Mr. Robert Schwimmer. sacred place for the uh, Chumash. Um, and, you know, they've been there probably thousands of years and still special to them today. And of course, the first European discovery of the Cape uh, was uh, Cabrillo uh, in 1542. So I want to give you kind of a sense of this place tonight, what went on over the years. I, I'm not going to really go into a lot of the uh, early exploration. So uh, the Cape, you know, has had many names over the years. Um, again, not going to go into a lot of the descriptions of those names, but in the 19th century, uh, one of the names that was documented in the Coast Pilots uh, and also uh, some of the early charts was the uh, Cape Horn of the Pacific, and, and that's what I'd like to talk about uh, tonight. And also the uh, Cape Hatteras of the subject has uh, been mentioned in the past too, but. Uh, George Davison with the Coast Survey uh, continued discussing the, the hazards of this location. One of the problems we have is um, approaching this cape is the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, the coastline is east-west, where predominantly the 
California coastline is north-south. Can you be come sailing along nice calm water, Santa Barbara Island, and make that turn around the Cape, as uh, Carrillo did in 1542, and go no further? The Northwest winds are just extremely strong. I've been out there where I've been in Coco Bay, which you'll learn about, and I've come around the corner, and it, it's just a whole different world. And, and it becomes you know, that tradition of the Cape itself. And this was actually a relatively calm day when I <laughs> so, anybody have a clue what the single largest migration by sea to California was? Gold Rush. Gold Rush? It's not the uh, Rose Bowl Parade? <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Although it does happen in January uh, every year. Uh, January of 1848, Sutter Mill, uh, discovery of gold, which spawned say that the single largest migration in California by sea. And you know, hundreds of ships from all over the world came to California. And some of those uh, chose to uh, hug the coastline. And over the years, uh, many, you know, probably thousands of ships over the years have had the transit of waters uh, around Point Conception. So the Coast Survey, uh, actually before the gold rush, was planning to come out and do a survey along the western coastline, mostly the Oregon Territory, because a lot of people were settling in Oregon. And so the survey was planned, uh, and then all of a sudden the gold rush came on, and it was very important to uh, get out here and, and survey the coastline to give mariners more information uh, in documenting this coast and keeping them out of harm's way. And the Ewing had left uh, the East Coast and actually arrived in San Francisco in 1849 and started surveying uh, San Francisco, which was a very important port, and also uh, Tomales Bay, uh, just to the north there. Uh, Steamer Humboldt arrived here with uh, MacArthur, uh, which actually several ships had been named in his honor, but he was head of the Coast Survey for the West Coast uh, in the early part, which uh, changed pretty early on. So moving ahead a little bit, 1853 was probably the biggest hit uh, to the uh, Pacific Mail and other uh, shipping companies uh, that were on the Panama uh, to San Francisco route. And as you can see, we've got uh, the SS Lewis uh, off Duxbury Reef that was trying to enter San Francisco. We have the Tennessee, which now is Tennessee Cove, uh, just north of the gate, uh, also wrecked. And then uh, the Independence uh, off Baja. And I think there's one other wreck in 1853 we're missing. Anybody have a clue? Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott. Scott. You guys are good. <laughs> We've got an exhibit, actually, uh, two exhibits featuring the Winfield Scott. And actually, it segues really nicely into the uh, Brunel Lens exhibit. So you guys pass. And, and there, there may be a test. And that test may have a reward. Uh, and I promise not to throw it, Andy. Well, maybe not. But, you know, with the shipwrecks, the key is no lighthouses, no buoys, beacons to guide ships. And that's a big deal. Uh, so, moving along here. So the uh, topographic survey of near shore and coastline was used basically to determine the uh, geodetically a reference point to delineate the shoreline and eventually across North America. So we had already started on the East Coast, and now, of course, the mission was out here in the West Coast, and then connecting across North America, latitude and longitude. So some really great illustrations done by uh, Taylor, uh, and where he really did some extensive work with the Coast Survey. And here's a triangulation that they had to go through. And these guys climb mountain peaks high elevations, lugging, theodolites, and all sorts of equipment. And today we've actually taken an overlay of modern um, GIS layers to tie in with 19th century surveys, and they are almost right on. It's just amazing. These guys were so ahead of their time. That area was uh, probably Puget Sound we were looking at. So in 1850, uh, George Davison, uh, which probably has six decades in the Coast Survey, a uh, leading scientist in his field, prolific author, Coast Pilots, uh, his greatest body of work, 1889, Coast Pilot, illustrations, 
Um, but he ended up in San Francisco, that a lot of his materials sit the bank rock there. But he came out here on the uh, Burnham, the bar. I don't know if there's a correlation to Burnham Wood, but uh, they were, uh, <laughs> he came out with uh, James Lawson and, and Harrison and spent about two, uh, two and a half months out here. And as Davison says, the old coast is considered the uh, southern headland to be the most dangerous to sail around in the west coast. And look at these guys lugging this equipment. Rockwell brought a telescope over 300 pounds, and he had to lug it from the beach there in Coho. And you can see off in the distance is uh, Point Conception. So they're out here determining latitude and longitude, which is very important. Uh, with this cape. So, Mr. Batch here, uh, related also to Harper Batch, uh, inspector, there was a, an act in uh, 1850 of September that actually required to establish uh, eight lighthouses in the West Coast, seven of which were in California. One of the mandates of this mission was come back with the recommended location for a lighthouse at Point Conception. So here we go. All this equipment set up, and here at Coho Bay, at least we got the name right now, uh, they created basically uh, this scientific field station on the top of the plateau and, and created this wooden observatory to protect the delicate instruments that they had to use. As a matter of fact, when they left this scene, remember they came by ship, they said, we're gonna get a mule team and we're going to Santa Barbara by the road. <laughs> but the chronometers that they had, they all carried them by hand the entire run because they didn't want to damage them. That's how delicate this instrument was. So, you know, a lot of strong winds, dust as we mentioned out there. So you can see Point Conception off in the distance there. And look at the technology, 1850. Night sightings, uh, sphere, three points, meridian, zenith, and horizon, using the stars, angles from points determined for latitude, longitude from the equator, the center of the Earth. And bingo, they establish the true latitude and longitude of point conception. Now we just walk out there with our GPS. <laughs> so here is where the observatory was located, uh, right there in Coho. And then off to the left here is actually where Point Conception is. And this was the first topographic map completed. And this is, uh, again, 1850. So we've come a long way in 400 years from the early uh, mapping that was done there. Uh, this is, what, 1601 or so? Two. So it's another part of the Coast Survey responsibility besides doing the top, uh, topographic uh, maps is hydrographic charts, really key, especially off Point Conception. Uh, if you've seen some of the pictures, like Dewey's picture up there up on the ceiling, uh, there's some, some pretty hazardous pinnacles uh, out there off site. So in those days, we used you know, sounding uh, weights and very methodical process and sounding and Again, probably took months to complete this. But look at this, in 10 years, the Coast Survey covered over 7,000 square miles of coastline in the continental US, as well as uh, up in Washington, well, uh, Alaska. And it's just amazing. These guys were just, probably never took time off. Kind of like me. So here's, the, uh, the chart, uh, hydrographic chart that was completed by Alden uh, under his command. Alden continued to do surveys off Channel Islands, uh, also up into Alaska for several years. He was uh, with the Navy, uh, working for the Coast Survey. So you can see example again where the uh, observatory is and how much area they had covered, which was again real critical for mariners coming around the Cape. Today we use multi-beam Sonar, side scan sonar. This is an example of the Okeanos Explorer, which travels all over the world. And there's one of our multi-beams. 
little bit faster than sounding lead, much prettier. Uh, this is actually a shipwreck that I just had uh, multi beamed uh, in San Francisco Bay uh, a month ago, and I'm going to go up there in October, November, right east of the Golden Gate Bridge, and try to survey this in the shipping lanes. So you may have another casualty out there. <laughs> so also besides being incredible scientists, some of these guys are amazing artists. And in this case, uh, James Alden had brought one of his, I think he was a, a nephew, out to actually do drawings, which thank God they did because as Willard knows, there's not a lot of uh, photographs of the original Point Conception lighthouse. <laughs> so we really depend on these artists' illustrations. And here's an example of Kyler Harbor, San Miguel Island. That's, you know that location, don't you? <laughs> she was raised out there on the island. Uh, this is a Ewing inactive, uh, which would survey ships, uh, Ewing being the sailing ship, which by the way, when it did arrive in San Francisco, the crew, uh, several mutants. And they were actually captured, and they were hung. Yeah, so no messing around. That was part of the problem of doing survey work. Uh, and matter of fact, when George Davison was doing his survey work uh, at Point Conception, he needed a cook. I won't call him a chef. And he, they were getting paid $70, roughly, uh, a month. The chef came, or cook came in at 128 and couldn't even make good coffee. So yeah, you hire out of San Francisco, you pay the price, clearly. So even the artists captured Montecito Valley in the early adobe of the Christmas adobe. It's amazing. <laughs> Some of the ships offshore there. So during this period, uh, finally, Act of Congress, they made a decision. We're gonna get a lighthouse at Point Conception light it and they will come, said the Commodore <laughs> Christmas. And it's true. They have come. So the construction of the lighthouse actually started in 1854 due to those delays by Congress. But fortunately for us, uh, they did start. And whether the lighthouse would have served any purpose for the Yankee Blade, which was in the fog, 1854, hugging the coastline, working her way down to Panama, 800 passengers on board, struck the coastline north of Point Conception, took the lives of 30 on board, and the demands that came in August of 1855 by the uh, shipping lines, we respectively begged for a fog bell, a lifeboat at Point Conception, its particular geographic position, isolated and dangerous, lying as it does directly in the track of the whole trade from San Francisco to Panama. Well, we never got a lifeboat there uh, with that cliff line, uh, would not have been feasible. We did get a, a not a life-saving station of sorts uh, later many years later uh, at Point Arguello, uh, but the harm was actually already done. They didn't really rescue many people. And so here's our first drawing of the uh, lighthouse that was being erected. Uh, the original was completed in mid-summer of 1854, stood uh, 215 feet uh, up on that, above sea level, up on the bluff. The uh, lighthouse, uh, building itself was built out of brick as well as the tower. It's a uh, story and a half. Pretty much cookie cutter of some of the lighthouses you would see along the west coast. But the government inspector arrived uh, in uh, August of 1855, and this is Major uh, Hartman Batch. Uh, and he uh, confronted uh, the work done by Francisco uh, Gibson E. Kelly, also Francisco, uh, that they found that the, first of all, the lantern room wasn't big enough to handle a first order for no lens. Big problem. <laughs> lens being built on its way. Uh, 
also the uh, mortar around the bricks was already decaying. So had to tear down the tower, rebuild. New plans had to be drawn. And while he was out there, he was making other inspections and found a lot of things that were incorrect. So we had to come, he came up with a new set of plans here in September of 1855. And you can see the focal plane. And actually in the previous picture, they actually put in a design to have a fog signal bell out there, which of course we know the shipping companies wanted. So, just to give you a, a sense of place, there's Point Conception, there's Coho Bay. <laughs> Probably as a crow fly, a mile and a half, but nobody goes as a crow fly. And then you've got that elevation gain of 215 feet. So, oxen came into play, uh, rough, rough trip. And, and kind of going back to uh, Rockwell carrying that 300-pound uh, telescope up the cliff line. So in the meantime, the, uh, the Fresnel lens, which uh, had been built in Paris, France in 1854 by Auguste and Michael Henry Le Fou, uh, was basically designed uh, largely on Auguste and Jean, Jean Fresnel's uh, design. And uh, I believe he was commissioned to build six of them. Uh, point, uh, the Farallon Island lens had arrived ahead of time, and we actually documented the name of the ship arising, arriving in San Francisco. Unfortunately, uh, research still hasn't yielded a name unless you've come up with a ship that came from Paris around Cape Horn uh, to San Francisco. But fortunately, we know uh, that the uh, General Peace Price, yeah, uh, Pierce, it's right, um, had actually left San Francisco in 1855 and arrived in September. And you gotta remember that this lens, even though it's broke down in several sections and the, the pedestal is still in its you know, full mass, we're talking over 5,500 pounds of crates that have to be lightered from this small two massive schooner through the surf onto the beach. And fortunately for us, uh, or for the light day through, they had a calm day there. Uh, so Hartman uh, had reported in uh, September 1855 uh, that General Pierce arrived here on the 11th and had just finished landing her freight for this place. The freight was landed as well as it could be. Some of the boxes had to be opened on board on the account of the weight of them. So again, look at what you've got across through the surf onto the beach. But I have taken all possible care that nothing should be lost or damaged. On the 19th, he writes, we have the brickwork of the tower nearly up and the second floor and now in the condition to make pretty good progress. The last freight was landed at the tower landing a considerable distance from the house and I was compelled to send some 30 miles to get another team to do the hauling. And we're talking team of oxen. As part of the freight must be removed before the full moon. Why? When the tide's tide would reach and lies in the beach. So, gotta get a move on. So, some people consider uh, this lens another fragile artifact. It's been described by our executive director here, Fabergé. It really is on a pedestal. Come on, <laughs> you gotta agree. So the, uh, the first order lands, you know, they're basically uh, ranked six to first uh, in measure and refracting power in the longest focal length, which is the first order. And the first order was typically used on main headlands uh, and capes uh, along the coastline. The sixth order was smaller, didn't shine as bright. And you find those inside of bays, uh, typically. Uh, there are a couple lenses that were actually constructed over time that were bigger. Uh, than the uh, first order. But our lens is the first order. You can see the panels here. So we got 16 identical panels, as you can see there. Uh, each has a central bullseye, which is that focal plane that I was telling you about. And of course, all this had to be assembled in 1855 up at the lighthouse. In 
if you guys had a chance to come here, you would see it being assembled in person. Magnificent. And I think we have a time lapse coming, or it's here, showing us taken apart and reassembled here. So, finally, February 1st, 1856, the Point Conception light has been exhibited. It took a while. Uh, and it was reported this next day in Washington, D.C. This is a big deal. Treasury Department probably likes to have this, <laughs> you know, off their uh, agenda there. But fortunately, uh, we have a 624 individual prisms. And again, we're talking about 1.3 million candle power. I mean, think of this as a, a kind of a, a magnification between the lantern through the Fresnel lens would reach 24 miles out to sea. And you can see there's the, this would be the focal plane. They're up there 215 feet. So 33 feet above that is where the light is. And so we're looking at 248, 250. Give, give a couple feet, actually uh, became a problem. Concealed by fog, as we're gonna learn here. Yes, uh, so her light characteristic, which was very important when you look at your coast charts uh, to know where you are, either by a fog signal, uh, which is audio, or of course, by the light. But her signature uh, was a white beam, three second flash every 30 seconds, and the rotation was full eight minutes. So before electricity, you know, we had, there was some talk about maybe sperm oil being used. We have found no documentation on that, although it was heavily used in the East Coast. Um, we do know that uh, draft seed oil or coza oil, which is basically a vegetable-based uh, oil is used. We had lard oil has been documented. Uh, kerosene, uh, mineral oils uh, were also used, which was also, uh, we've got one of the uh, lanterns of, from the 1870s there we, in the display. And so there's the focal plane off point conception. And again, here's uh, Hartman's drawing uh, from 1859. He's the inspector, but he's also an accomplished <laughs> artist and has probably given us one or two views of the first lighthouse. So two weeks later, captain of the Golden Gate spots the lens and reports it in the newspaper. 42 miles off, sea, off the coast. It's like, wait, 24? Luma lights. But impressive. And I'm sure they were very happy. I thought it was pretty smart that he was 42 miles off the coast there. Um, but so one of our uh, First lighthouse keepers, head keepers out there, uh, George Parkinson, he actually arrived uh, a little bit early. He was there in September of 1854. I believe he arrived on the 6th. And as we know, there was no lens in the lighthouse. So uh, I guess the uh, local two match thought it'd be a great hunting lodge and uh, asked them politely to you know, vacate. And they actually shared with him that the deceased uh, spirits of Chumash uh, leave for the afterlife at Point Conception. So again, it's, it's that sacred place that we were talking about. Uh, Willard probably knows how long he was out there without pay. Um, checking the mail was a golden mail in that day period. But, uh, but finally, in the newspaper accounts uh, and of course the Treasury Department, we were learning that you know, he was paid originally uh, a whopping $750 a year. And then he was elevated to a thousand in 1855. Uh, when he actually got that money, I'm not sure. But he became very vocal uh, in the local newspapers about sharing this uh, magnificent uh, new lantern. Uh, but he also uh, shared a little problem they had out there. Shortly after the uh, light was exhibited, they had a gale and blew out some of the windows in the new lighthouse on the 15th, I believe, of February. So it gives you a sense of place. These guys, the hardship that they dealt with, being out there so isolated. And the duties of a lighthouse keeper, 
These are probably the main duties. There's several more. Uh, the wiki, uh, changing and trimming the wicks. You wanted to make sure they kept trim so there was not a lot of smoke. Maggot, you know, they wanted to, you know, the smoke would create soot on the lens and on the windows in the lantern room. So that was important. Of course, light extinguish the light every day, keeping the clockwork counterweight operating with time rotation, which is critical. That's why they all had stopwatches. Uh, because never people, the characteristic of that light can't change, otherwise it will throw off navigation. Clean and polish prisms uh, in the ladder room and maintain the fog signal and daily log entries, critical. And unfortunately, um, Skolan that was there had wonderful handwriting, and which is in the exhibit there, there's an example of it. So we've kind of talked about some of the civilian keepers Brief uh, the headkeepers uh, from the first occupation, uh, 1856, up to when the Coast Guard occupied it. And to really get a sense of the history, those first person accounts, we've got a new book that is maybe one of those books for the right answer. They come your way, but it's available tonight. Uh, you know, we talk about that, that place of awe out there. Uh, when Willard went out there, it was inspired not only by the place and the mechanical genius, but about the people. It's really about the people that maintain this. It's about the people now, yourselves, collectively, bringing this lens here. And he's captured this in his book, and I will let him tell those stories. So finally, Fox signal bell arrives, 1857. You know, Parks was talking about it arriving a year earlier, but it did arrive. A mere 3,136 pounds? Coho. Again, can you imagine? Again, we've got Hartman uh, capturing the ox team, carrying the bell out to the location. So a little uh, forensic uh, anthropologist took a little DNA and some of the census records, and we think we know what John Skolan looked like. Um, a letter uh, from Skolan to a Hartman. Sir, I have to report to you the practical results and labor to sound the fog bell at this station. For the following period, Saturday, January 24th AM, calm and foggy for 14 consecutive hours. The bell sounding all the time. When the bell commenced sounding, the machinery was wound up to its full height. It runs seven and a half hours, no longer. Then to keep the bell sounding, it's necessary for one keeper to wind the weight. When the bell is not sounding, it takes 540 turns of the handle to gain one turn of chain on the cylinder. When the bell sounds, it takes 974 turns of the hand to gain one turn on the cylinder. Anybody want to be a lighthouse keeper or something? <laughs> so appropriations were made uh, in March 3rd of 1871 to finally establish 100 feet down the cliff face uh, a first class steam fog signal. Uh, as you can see there, it runs with a, a steam boiler, be coal fired. So, what happened to the bell then at Point Conception? I know Willard's chasing it. We got to get up there. But he said it's at Goat Island. Anybody know where Goat Island is? No. Okay. Well, the annual report of the Secretary of Treasury, the State of Finances of 1874, your Belinda, San Francisco, California. The Fog Bell recently used at Point Conception Light Station, California, has been put up here and is operated by a Stevenson's clock apparatus. So we saw that at Point Conception. Congress at its last session uh, made an appropriation of $10,000 for the establishment of the lighthouse and fog signal, which is interesting is the fog signal went in before the lighthouse. Because <laughs> as we know in San Francisco, that's the biggest concern Mariners had was having the audio, not the light. 
And it actually was a secondary fog signal. They did have uh, another one, but it was, they say it was always cranked and ready to go. So many lighthouses, as we know, have ghost stories. And Willard can correct me, but I only know of one fatality at Point Conception. Uh, one of the assistant uh, lighthouse keepers, W.H. Phillips, was out fishing in 1875 and fell off the cliff. And his, his two companions tried to rescue him, but he died. And so there's always been, you know, some joking about the ghost at Point Conception. All looks pretty familiar. It kind of looks like a curator. So Ron uh, Rutowski, uh, who visited uh, the service um, in the service of the Coast Guard described one day at work, the crew was joking about the ghost in the lighthouse. And so they were doing some maintenance on the uh, chariot wheels, and the tools started disappearing. And later that day, they found the tools at the bottom of the steps. So the joking has stopped, at least inside the lighthouse. So by 1875, our lighthouse out of Point Conception there uh, had cracks. A recent earthquake didn't help. Uh, it was actually being held up by wood supports. And it was a pretty bad condition. So in 1880, the lighthouse board reported to Congress that, you know, we've got to get a new lighthouse. And they had requested $38,000 uh, for that lighthouse uh, to include a uh, watching station and an oil house and tower. So Congress uh, appropriated 40000 It's like, wow, they got more money? Well, it was also to purchase land rights. <laughs> so as you can see, this is the uh, reservation uh, of that area, the new lighthouse. Uh, is that 1874-ish? All drawn out. And it, it makes you wonder. Why did they have to appropriate money to buy land? Didn't they already have land? Could it be that the federal government was squatters? Well, here we have the deed, uh, which was recently shared with us from 1878 for the reservation. So I think there's another chapter to US <laughs> government as squatters. <laughs> I wouldn't know. So in the, the uh, lighthouse was constructed in 1881, but remember, we got an aid to navigation that's active out there. So how do we keep it while we're building the new lighthouse? How do we maintain that aid to navigation? Well, you can still get another lens. So they got a fourth order lens, of course, much smaller, and they built a platform above the new lighthouse and erected this while they started taking apart the first order lens at the original uh, lighthouse and then to reassemble it in the new lighthouse. So on June 20th, 1882, the light was exhibited. So George Davison, which had finished the uh, Coast Survey uh, um, Coast Pilot in 1889, the lighthouse is built on the southeast part of the point within 33 yards of the shore. The lighthouse structure consists of a low brown tower of great massiveness. Hmm. Rising behind and above the low tower, a brown building, the dome of the uh, lantern is red. Okay. Not many colored pictures from back then. And so this is the only picture that I'm aware of of the original lighthouse structure. As you can see, the tower is gone. You can see the rods coming through the building, which probably added support. So they've now made this a dwelling. Um, you can see the keeper and his wife and uh, two daughters. Uh, is this Thomas Perry's period, 1894, is when this was taken? So, good chance. Probably not him. Probably not him. Okay. And again, there's that important focal plane. In this case, it's only 133 feet above the water which is below that marine layer, that fog. Uh, so much better location. 
And this is the view from the tower, a uh, shot I took in 07. So, welcome to Lighthouse number two. So, instructions to Lighthouse Keepers, July 1881. Keepers must be courteous and polite to all visitors who conform to the regulations. You can see the ones that don't. And show them everything of interest about this station. At such times, it will not interfere with the lighthouse duties. And this was kind of interesting. Special care must be taken to prevent scratching of names and initials on the glass of the lanterns and windows of the tower. And actually, I found this on Anacapa Island, the Coast Guard station out there. There was a lot of historic graffiti, which now I find fascinating. But can you imagine on a prison? Oh my gosh. And our lampists that worked on this um, could not believe what great condition this is in, because that's not what they typically find. Part of the isolation point conception. Plus, there was that warning of radiation on the front door, uh, which I always find, you know, what power is this thing? I'm not going in there. You going in there? No. No. I thought that was the best thing the Coast Guard ever did. Ever. So here is the counterweight, which is uh, drives the clockworks. And this weight is 140 pounds. But what it did, it had to be wound up every four hours. Hopefully you got more gain on it than you did on the uh, fog signal bell. But it forced the keeper or assistant to go to the top of the lighthouse in the lantern room every four hours, which meant he would observe what's going on and make sure everything's working fine. So he would have to crank this 140 pound weight up. And then this, the clockworks would cause the rotation. So basically you're looking at a clock without arms, but it's the rotation, that eight minute rotation of the lens. And we actually have that counterweight upstairs. Uh, but please don't lift it. So the uh, instructions to Keeper 1881, the revolving clock work must be carefully kept from dust. It must be oil, clock oil. Whenever necessary, care being taken to remove old and gummy oil before new oil is applied. All parts made of iron and steel must be rubbed with the clock greased with tallow. The foot of the fly shaft must be examined occasionally to see that it's not cutting or wearing, and the cherry wheels or carriage upon which the lens revolves must be carefully wiped and the rollers properly oiled. And beautiful drawing by Debbie, uh, which has been featured in our exhibit, but this is the, uh, the cable coming down through the tower. And as you can see on the level there, and then at the base is the well. And we also have recovered the well from Point Conception. Um, it must have been a task. And a, so you can go up there and see the original. And you should note also with the movement, the rotation of this lens, that this weight had to be adjusted. So every day they had to time the rotation of this lens. Climate, climatic conditions could actually affect it. And so constant, again, that clockwork, a big clock. So this gives you a sense of the compound that grew out there. You know, this was so isolated. Santa Barbara was the closest town for years. A lot of what came to Point Conception was through the lighthouse tenders that dropped it off. It wasn't until years that the train came through. The one road that we had up there, we had to cross uh, on a low tide, but look at all the outbuildings uh, that were at this site. So something broke, they had to build it, they had to make it. That cable broke on the counterweight, they had to replace it. So besides those main tasks you saw as a keeper, there was ongoing grounds work uh, and maintenance out there. And, and you look at all the dwellings too, is the families. Keepers, wives, kids were out there, and they had to be had to be shipped off to eventually Lompoc, places like that, for weeks at a time to go to school. So here's a, a view of the uh, fog signal building and the fog horns, and in the center you can see the uh, third assistant's uh, 
dwelling, keeper's house, and of course the right, the lighthouse. And if you look at, if I don't blind somebody, three bucks off, I'm sorry. This is the uh, coal chute and supply chute they would bring down. So bringing supplies in were easy, taking them out might have been a challenge. And this is uh, the steps to go down. So now you've got the winding of the crank, work your upper body, now you've got the stair stepper. So people kept in good shape. Uh, I'm and these are the uh, Fox Signal buildings. Uh, this is 1894, part of that series we just saw. The uh, smokestacks there uh, were replaced uh, in 1906 by a 40 foot brick chimney. Eventually, uh, crude oil uh, replaced the use of coal at the site. And, and this is, you know, when we created this exhibit, we really wanted it to be historically correct. And this lower railing no longer exists on the second lighthouse. But it's a very unique feature, and we've captured that in the exhibit. The railing around the base of the Purnell lens is based on this design. So, kind of your own little balcony uh, <laughs> overlooking the oak, seeing the light. So, Thelma Austin, uh, she was the daughter of the keeper, Willie Austin, first assistant. And I quote, when I was growing up, into a young woman, my father accepted the post of lighthouse keeper at Point Conception, one of the most isolated points on the Pacific coast. And here I experienced many marine disasters. I never forgot that terrible night when I went to witness my first shipwreck, when the lumber freighter Shasta went on the rocks and was slowly dashed to pieces. Although the sight sort of chilled me, I derived a grim satisfaction, nevertheless, from the knowledge that my dear father was doing everything within his power to save that crew. And they only lost one. And here's some of the uh, debris uh, was washed up on the beach from the Shasta that recently located in San Francisco, these pictures. So Anne reported the Commissioner of Lighthouses for 1917, Point Conception Lighthouse Station, for near $7,237. They replaced the steam fog, uh, steam boilers with 12-inch whistles and duplicated gas engines and air compressors operating the G diaphragm. And as you can see, it's the air whistle. So in the 1970 Coast Pilot, they said the fog signal uh, air diaphragm was Blast three seconds, silent for four seconds, blast three seconds, and silent for 50 seconds. And I'm sure all the keepers had that memorized. Uh, I couldn't imagine living day in and day out on foggy days, especially on that lower bluff. But uh, again, this is a characteristic of sound, of location, of aid to navigation, just as critical. So, also in 1917, even with the new fog signal in place, even the military is no exception to shipwrecks. And this is the USS McCulloch uh, Coast Guard Cutter heading northbound to San Francisco, going to be refitted. All her new equipment's on deck. You've got the governor southbound in fog and does a fatal blow right into the starboard bow of the McCulloch. 35 minutes later, she went to the bottom. Uh, no loss of life. The, they were able to recover uh, all except one that eventually died in a hospital. So six years later, on a naval disaster, again, military, they don't escape the fogs. Devil's Jaw, uh, here we have uh, Destroyer Squadron 11, high-speed maneuver going from San Francisco to San Diego, 23 knots, thinking they have cleared point conception, didn't hear a fog signal. Didn't see a light, but made a course change too far north, 095, down California real estate. Nine destroyers hit, seven destroyers remain. Navy's worst peacetime disaster. Nice little exhibit back there. But as we talked about, you know, the isolation out there with the roads only being available at low tide, it really took a toll on the trucks and vehicles that eventually <laughs> got out there. 
this is all that remains uh, in 2007 in the UPS truck, at least to make deliveries out there. <laughs> Hey, 1948, throw the switch. Electricity comes, telephone comes. Matter of fact, there's the Funk's hydraulic uh, float lamp uh, being disassembled. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have electricity and fun out there after all these years? And like, remember that focal plane is so critical, and so they had to engineer the platforms or the lights Anytime there's a change. And this is the lamp changer uh, drafted up here. 1,500 watts, again, generated 1.3 million candle power, magnified by the lens, 22, 24 miles out to sea. And you can see there's two light bulbs. And when one goes out, it switches. But always maintaining that perfect focal plane. Then we changed in the 1950s. And fortunately, these light bulbs are here. Uh, the Halama Cafe donated these, so you can see them in person. I believe that's Emily's favorite little display besides this little lens. Uh, they were used in the 1950s, and guess what? They're still in use today. This is a lighthouse I photographed up in Oregon. There they are. Some things never change. It works. Not broken. So here's a, the Keeper's Duplex uh, in 1950, up on the very top of the hill here. There's those 84, 184 steps. So what year did the Coast Survey survey out there um, finish the first chart, Point Conception? 1850, somewhere over there. Not all of you are asleep yet. So here's circa 1965, and you can still see that the welling duplex is still there. You've got a water tower and tank, uh, the fog signal building on the lower bluff. But look at that ocean. You know, again, it speaks of the Cape, the Cape Horn of the Pacific. Just, uh, can you imagine just living there day in and day out in isolation, never getting away from the wind? Whoa, not again. Even in modern navigation, it comes down to human error. Pat Baroness loaded 21,000 metric tons of copper concentrate to parts San Pedro for Japan. Lenick Wing inbound to uh, Long Beach to bunker, basically add more fuel, continue through the Panama Canal, and drop off on the cars. They see each other. They are on radar. They use grease pencils to plot. They don't communicate. They don't talk. And the Atlantic wing strikes just forward of the wheelhouse, almost cutting the Pack Baroness in two. 1987. Geysers of water blew up and drops in 1,500 feet of water. OK, Don got there before I did. He was there in 1988 and did an ROV survey. But just to prove that it, he did a good job, I returned in 2002 and filmed the same stern section. A little bit marine growth over the years. And just to get a sense of place again, this is what we're seeing in 2007. Less a lens, less a weight, less counterweight. But the, some of the structures, uh, foundations, are still out there. So this is 38. 2007, and in 1981, she's listed on the National Register of Historic Places because of her historical significance to the American public. I think landmarks next. And in 2000, she's decommissioned. She was automated. Uh, what was that? There's a replacement. Little Fresnel lens design pattern going there. Probably only goes out maybe half the distance, but automated. But look at how dwarfed it is by this, what, 19 foot tall lens. And that's the last we see of it. So 1881 coming forward. 
What remains at Point Conception? This was a challenge. Uh, I photographed this out there uh, in 2010, and the Lighthouse Society had photographed it in the 1970s, or I had a picture from the 1970s. And this is this speaks to the need of conservation for this lens. You know, due diligence, shine and polish, follow the lighthouse keeper's instructions, but you're also the degradation that also comes with polishing brass. And it took me two years to decipher this. And I actually had to get some of the information from the first order lens from Fairlawn Island. But somebody sandblasted their builder spray. So I was within a couple of names of finishing this, and I, I approached the lampus. One sacrificial shine, please. He said, no. And I praise him for that. So it made me dig and dig further, but we finally have the corrected um, inscription. But again, it, it talks about that place and location, why this lens needs to be here for and so here's the uh, keeper's watch room uh, for the second lighthouse. And that goes, getting tools again. <laughs> Maybe she's returning this time. <laughs> they are downstairs. <laughs> and there's the uh, nice bookcase, which I understand needs navigation uh, currently has now. Had a little problem removing some about square nails. Hello. Fireplace, which I'm sure was lit every night out there. And there's the uh, oil room. And at this point, there's probably 55 gallon drums elevated, so you can fill a spigot. And in 1911, they built this structure, another dwelling. It's still there today. Look how close it is to the cliff there. Spectacular view. Now, would you trust this picket fence? <laughs> These guys must have built it just finished, it, I swear. I wouldn't be leaning. It. After that cliff drop off, I've been there. It blows, and I back away. But look at the structure. This is uh, 2007, but look at the 1911, the porch. They enclosed it. Windy? Look at the large window panes, how small they are now. Yep. So they're adapting to the conditions of point conception over time. And I understand it's boarded up now, Willard, last time you were there. I got a lot of photos inside, but it, it is a spectacular view. And then in 2012, Emily's lights changed. Everybody's lights changed in this museum. We had the honor to receive and be the curators of this lens. What is it? Have you guys seen that out on the porch? You know what that is? It's a foghorn? Exactly, uh, electric oscillating. So this foghorn was there in 2007. I think I'm still deaf in my left ear. Those pictures you saw up in the mural of crashing waves, this thing was probably 25 yards or less off my left. Extremely loud. And yes, I know the characteristic of it. And as you can see, it's a, it's a you know, it's has two sets of horns because you, you know, have to have redundancy uh, because one goes out, you can't stop. Uh-oh. Just when we thought the lens was correct, we found out one of the panels wasn't lined up. Where's Greg? Greg, <laughs> explain this flaw. I asked them when they were putting that on, I'm like, well, you, no, I think you're a little bit off. It's not all centered. The top diactics were put off a little uh, by a few inches, so it sent out a smaller warning signal to the mariners because 1850s, they're raising sails really busy. That would give them a warning so they could pull out their timepiece. Then when they get the main flash, they start counting. Second main flash, 30 seconds, I'm at point conception. Uh, Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Guys, uh, just adjust that. You can actually see that up at the top of the lens, that offset, that pre-flash. And of course, it's in the design, but I wouldn't show grade this till afterwards. <laughs> and so, in closing, you know, the spirit of commitment. And it's, 
it's not only the people in this room, the donors, the people that have worked hours and hours to fast track this, to meet the Coast Guard schedule, to ensure this thing for $2 million, to go through the bureaucratic paperwork, to commit to the conservation and future endowment, uh, which we still need to fundraise and make happen. But it's also, we're doing it for the people that insured and took care of that magnificent lens through 160 years out there. It's, we're obligated to do, you know, conserve their good work and interpret it for future generations. So, buy your book over here. We have mugs. We have shirts. Look at that. Come help support it. Thank you. Once he was touched by the cape, was it the ghost or just the uh, pilot? Well, I want you to know that we've got some people in the audience tonight uh, who actually experienced the ghost. <clears throat> if I can get them to stand up, Bruce and Sandy. Bruce was a Coast Guard keeper up at Point Conception in 1969, am I correct? inspired this book. I am so privileged to have been able to contact people through historical records, but also people in person like Bruce and Sandy to get their stories. And this book is mostly the story of keepers. There's some information pretty much documenting everything that, that Bob said tonight. Um, if you want a little bit more history on the land dispute, yes, the U.S. government was squatting. Woo! Um, Hope you enjoy it. Yes, ma'am. Is the ghost male or female? Female. Anyone die in childbirth there? Uh, Bruce, can I tell him the story? <laughs> the story is that, um, as we've talked about tonight, there was a, a Chumash Indian campsite up in the area. And apparently there was some kind of um, maybe romance or love affair between one of the Chumash Indian maidens and one of the lighthouse keepers. But the lighthouse keeper thought perhaps the relationship was inappropriate or perhaps he just got transferred to a different station. But anyway, the romance stopped and it broke the Indian maiden's heart. And so every night she would come down, walk through property into the lighthouse, she climbed the stairs to the tower, and she threw herself off. Broken heart. But in the 60s, when Bruce and Sandy were there, they remember, at least on one occasion, hearing footprints walking through the ice plant, going down to the tower, although they could never find any evidence that anyone had been there. That's the ghost of Point Conception. This guy is amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let's uh, very much appreciate it. Please stick around if you have any questions. Thank you again. We hope to see you up here on Saturday. Thank you so much.